Welcome back to our series on objects of crisis in which we look at objects in the collection of the British Museum to learn about how people in the past have tackled major challenges, how they have prevailed and sometimes faltered. And today is my great pleasure to welcome Mary Beard, scholar, broadcaster, trustee of the British Museum, to ask her which object she has looked at. The choice for me was very, very easy. There is a truly wonderful bronze head of the first Roman emperor, Augustus, in the British Museum collection. It's a, it's a haunting head. It's very popular, partly because it still has its inlaid eyes. So it doesn't have that vacancy, which so many ancient statues seem to have when the inlay has come out of their eyes. And I suppose I've been studying it for about... 45 years, which is a bit horrifying. Um, <laughs> but uh, my views about it and its importance have changed. It's a terribly, it's a classic image of this first Roman emperor. But why is it in the British Museum? It's in the British Museum because it was fought over, it was controversial, it was uh, at, right at the middle of uh, first century power games. It's from a statue. It was once a full-length statue, now only survives as a head. Uh, a statue that must have been put up uh, it, in the province of Roman Egypt by the Roman officials as a kind of marker of uh, Roman power over the province. So it, it starts its life as uh, stamping the image of the emperor on the extremities of empire. So that must have been right after the conquest of the Roman conquest of Egypt and the integration of Egypt as a province into the expanding Roman Empire. It actually wasn't found in Roman Egypt. It was found uh, further south um, in Sudan, in what was then the Meroitic kingdom uh, of you know, Rome's awkwardly hostile neighbours. Um, uh, they no doubt thought that the Romans were their awkwardly hostile neighbours too. We don't really see it from their point of view. Um, but it was discovered uh, under the steps of a temple in the capital of the Meroitic kingdom, the city of Meroe. Why was it there? It can only be that uh, the people of Meroe, in their ongoing conflicts, low-level conflicts with the Romans in the, in the province of Egypt, they'd actually gone, invaded, snatched this statue, or at least its head, to be a marker of their victory over Rome. So the statue starts out life as a marker of Roman power, but that makes it a target for Rome's enemies, who then as it were, claim that statue for themselves, cut off its head, presumably, in a wonderful gesture of um, their control, and they bury it under the steps of one of the main temples of their city. So what did the Romans do? I mean, normally, you know, you, this is really defined. You take down the image of the ruler um, and you take it away with hostages. Um, so what did the Romans, what did Augustus do about that? It's not a particularly decisive moment. Sure, look, it's a decisive moment when you go and get that head and, you know, you've got the symbolic victory. Yeah. But throughout uh, the Roman Empire, and particularly on its margins, you're going to be having repeated struggles you know, we call them border struggles. They're about power struggles. It's about whose image we see, about who's boss here. And the, the Roman Empire is much less um, orderly and rule-bound than we give it credit for. I mean, basically, what they want is no trouble. <laughs> they haven't got the manpower to really stamp their control. Yeah. Um, in a very active way uh, over the landscape. That's why statues are so useful for them. In a way, they were there to guarantee cohesion. Um, you could put it like that. Um, I don't think that 
I would put it exactly like that. I see where you're coming from. I think that I would, I would kind of, you know, dig one layer deeper down than that mm -hmm. and say um, the, how we image power, how we image the divine, how we image ourselves in statue and painting, and what those images are for uh, is always absolutely central area of debate in any culture. I mean, I think one of the things that we find with all, you know, in, in, even in our current debates uh, about uh, the controversy over statues, you know, we're still wondering, you know, is, is a statue just a blob? You know, is it, is it a lump of stone or a lump of metal? You know, it's not alive. We're alive. The statue is powerless. Or is there something more in the statue um, that does encapsulate the power and the character of the person or the god who's represented? Yeah, or of the person, or of the people who put it up. Uh, you know, yeah. if you put up exactly. a statue um, of somebody who was a slave trader and a benefactor of his hometown, long after his death, then it's all about those people who put up this statue and make a statement with it. Um, and then it sits there for us to look at it, if we look at it, because you know, all these statues in the 19th century um, put up across the cities uh, of Europe, mostly are not ever looked at. They are just part of the, the kind of city furniture, you know. But of course, sometimes, and this is the case now, we very closely look at the symbolic political meaning. And that always leads us to ask, who put them up? Why were they put up? Yeah. Who wanted to make which kind of statement? And are we still fine with that statement? Or do we think today, this statement does not represent who we feel we are or who we feel we should be. That's absolutely right. And I think we all, always ought to see. And often in the past, it's quite hard to untangle this. But we have to see there's a triangulation here between the person represented, the person putting the statue up. You, you know, in the modern world, you very rarely put up a statue to yourself. Somebody else does it. And yeah. the people who look at it. And of course, the people who put the statue up and the people who look at it, they, they're not homogenous. They change over time. They have different views about what they're doing and they have different views about what they're seeing. I, I, I think that statues really, although we like to say they were put up to celebrate the people, and in part that must be true, I think the job the statue, the function of the statue, is to uh, help. It, uh, they're actually uh, helpful in debates about who we are, who we think we are, who we want to admire, but also debates about us, you know, and I think that, yeah. you know, that yeah. is really crucial. You know, you look at, uh, you look at people who, um, Rightly, I think, in my view, I mean, I think in almost everybody's view, rightly deplore, let's say, the, the, the money of enslavement that lay behind um, some of the most prominent statues in our public spaces. Uh, we rightly deplore that. I think those statues are partly there to remind us about ourselves and to ask us if we're kind of quite convinced that we're clean and they're dirty. Um, where's modern enslavement going on? You know, um, you know, and uh, you know, I'm as guilty of this as anybody. I don't, I don't look uh, at where the parts for my mobile phone are made or by whom or what conditions. And the, for me, the role of the statue is to nudge us and to prod us and to ask us about ourselves as much as, or as well as, asking us about these old fusty old blokes in the past. So how do you balance? Because you don't put the statue up as 
Um, this is a contribution to public debate. The moment we put it up, um, let's get together around this statue and debate controversially um, the ambiguous track record of this person. So when that shifts and we become aware of aspects of that person, which for us are no longer acceptable, which for us do not embody the ideals according to which we aspire to live together as community, also as a global community, then what, what happens to the statue? I think the, the basic point here is that one size does not fit all, right? And that uh, there could be almost no one in the world who thinks that all statues that were ever put up should stay and that none should come down. And what we debate is uh, which should come down or which should stay. Nor do I think that the act of taking statues down you know, and this goes for the statue of the Emperor Augustus. You know, that isn't erasing their history, it's giving them more history. You know, the history of uh, the so-called Meroe head of Augustus, that history is, is actually embodied by uh, the iconoclasm, uh, the looting, um, uh, yeah. uh, and the power. So it's, you know, you don't get rid of something's history by removing it. I think that what, what I would just press people to see a bit more than they do, though, you know, I, you know, I'm going to confess, I was very pleased when Copston came down. I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here um, uh, uh, saying that I, I, I'm, you know, that I'm a great statue lover at all costs. But I think we have to see that that function of the statue's celebration, that's just one moment in the statue's history, you know, and it is a moment. And for those there, it's an important moment. But like many things in the world, statues change their function over time. And they play different roles, and they become different, and they're looked at differently. And I think it, it can be useful, and I think profitable in terms of debate, like we're having now, which I think is a good debate, um, to say, I don't want that anymore. One just has to be a bit careful about a degree of modernist self-righteousness in all this, you know, and that's where I, you know, I do want to say, so when we put up statues of our heroes, what are they going to look like in 150 years time? No, what are people going to be saying about us? So acceptable, you could no longer see us in the public sphere. So I, I think that these statues are, in part about generating a bit of humility in the present, which often tends to be rather overconfident in its own moral values. And I think also it goes back to the, um, the, you know, the debates about what a statue is. I mean, sometimes I look at these statues of Victorian gentlemen who, they are mostly gentlemen, and you know, almost none of them do I feel kind of really on my side. But I also think you're just a statue and I'm alive. You know, we are now, we control you. Uh, we use you how we want. If we want to take you down, we can. If we want to leave you up and say, we don't want to do things like that anymore. Or to say, sometimes, look, we have to remember where some of our wealth came from. It's no good pretending um, that we're all clean. We, we are the beneficiaries, like it or not, of, in this country, enslavement. Um, and what are we going to do about it? You know, because in the end, what we're going to do about it is not just take statues down, we've got to do something. And there is a kind of way in which, this is another function of statues, and always has been, they sort of stand in for the person or the ruler, and uh, we sort of deal with them at a kind of symbolic level. Well, let's get real. <laughs> you know, let's do something at a real level. And our discussion is just one contribution to this. Let's Going hope. into the museum and taking the debate out of the museum. Let's hope. That's where I'd like it. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Mary. It was Thank a wonderful you. conversation.
Thank you for listening. If you liked it, please subscribe right here. And if you can, please donate to britishmuseum.org slash donate. Thank you very much indeed.